opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and Freedomslips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, Freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Cosmic Catastrophe on Revolution.radio, where information never sleeps. You're supposed to laugh. (laughs) I am your... (laughs) I'm your host, Diamond, from the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. Joining us is my partner and lovely co-host, Leah Shaper, L-E-A-H-S-H-A-P-E-R. P P as in Peter. Peter. Says it under your name. (laughs) It says it right under my face. (laughs) We've got a great show today on Revolution Radio, number one listener-supported internet radio on the internet. That I said internet twice. Today's episode is the second half of Cataclysmic Polarity Shift. We only got to page 17 of a quite a long document, and we really didn't cover some of the effects. And maybe we'll even have time to discuss some ways to prepare for what may eventually, what will eventually happen. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the news has been busy. It's been an exciting day. We had a major space weather event just about 12 hours ago. Multiple coronal mass ejections from two simultaneous flare events from two separate sunspot groups, both Earth-facing. And X flare. X 1.12. Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. And we've had now over six M flares from those regions, all Earth-facing in just the last uh, few hours. In fact, the last 24 hours have been quite active on the sun. Oh, I have to share the screen. You can't see the screen yet, can you? No, not yet. All right. Oh, we're also, I'm frozen up here. We're also going to discuss, can you hear me now? I can hear you. You're you're not frozen on my end. Okay, well, Skype just froze on me. Uh-oh. And it's not responding. Uh-oh. Yeah. Well, it's at least still broadcasting you. I don't know how to take care of the situation. Maybe it will recover itself and we can share the screen later. I'm going to restart the program. Uh-oh. No, I'm waiting right now. You could still hear me, though. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, let's discuss the news about the study claiming humans built the 25,000-year-old pyramid in Indonesia being removed by the journal. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did they um, – I didn't see – uh, the notice about the removal, did they cite a specific reason? Uh, yeah, because they lied in the paper. About? Uh, the age that they dated using carbon dating was simply a soil layer, and it had no right. association with anything anthropogenic. Right. Well, so and I think it's that- deceptive, and we that's what we determined. Yeah, and, and, and I, as, as I recall, they didn't hide the fact that they dated the soil, but they... They made they they came to a conclusion based on that that isn't warranted, right? The soil being twenty five thousand years old is meaningless in and of itself. You know, you need to actually date something that clearly has been created by humans in order to find a real date of the structure. So to rely on the surrounding soil is totally ridiculous. Ah, uh, agreed. I have to restart the program because I cannot interact with Skype. Okay. That means we might lose the radio show, but we'll be right back up. Okay. Hopefully it works. Well, keep talking because Skype is restarting. Can you still hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Now you're frozen, so you're probably gone now. So I'm going to jump in a little bit here to um, some of the consequences Um, that are indicated in this paper by Tyler Williams from the U.S. Air Force about a cataclysmic polarity shift. Um, So he goes into some detail about the potential consequences of CMEs as well as solar flares without CMEs on, let's say, our infrastructure. So 
one of the things that certainly would be, well, also let's go through some statistics here too about the likelihood of us being impacted on Earth by a CME or a solar flare. So just some stats. Generally speaking, you're going to get about one ejection a week from the sun. Um, but during solar max, that's going to be about two to three a day. It doesn't mean that everything's Earth facing. Um, and over a 200 year reversal period. So he's using, oh, there you are. Hello. Oh, I can't Can hear you, you hear now. Me? All now right, I can so we've hear been you. recording the whole time. That's great. Good, good. So I was just starting to go through uh, some of the impacts that Tyler Williams, who wrote this 2015 paper, um, but we can come back to that if you want to talk about this pyramid first. Yeah, we basically summed it up if it's been recording the whole time that uh, in this is a short article, just a few paragraphs. Um, retract, reacting to the retraction, the authors called the decision unjust, but the publisher and the co-authors and the investigators showed concerns, have concluded that the article contains a major error. The journal explained in the retraction notice that this error, which was not identified during peer review, I disagree. You and I peer reviewed it and we identified it. <laughs> <laughs> was that the radiocarbon dating was applied to soil samples that were not associated with any artifacts or features that could be reliably interpreted as anthropogenic. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the problem number one at the at the very basis. Um, I, as I recall, too, they were making some claims about some of the voids that they found in the pyramid, which, sorry, but they're not really indicative of anything in particular, right? They just found voids, but the shape doesn't necessarily indicate anything. It, it just means that you found some holes, but that doesn't mean anything. It could. Yeah, in, in an area that has lots of holes. Right. And right. Voids. Yeah. All right, so that's all the time we need to sp sp explain on that. Yeah. <clears throat> Just about an hour ago, ISWA and WSA put out the solar wind prediction for the incoming X 1.12 coronal mass ejection. Um, and it is a significant direct hit impact. When you look at ISWA here, um, the WSA Enlil spiral shows maybe a slightly less dense impact, but significant nonetheless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that all suggests that we are going to be having quite a nice geomagnetic storm in about 48 hours. But didn't we already have one last night? I looked at KP index and one station brought us all the way up to KP7. Yeah, for a brief period, we were at G1 geomagnetic storm from uh, a shift in the interplanetary field. So that mm. had, had nothing to do with anything coming from the sun. No. Oh. Every so often, there is a shift in the interplanetary field where the phi angle goes from Earth, sun to Earth to Earth to sun, and it's that mm -hmm. snapback in the magnetic field that triggers a geomagnetic field if the conditions are right. Storm, yeah. I uh... <laughs> And you can see it here on the telemetry. Let me shrink this down. So what happened two, one, two, three days ago, you see how everything jumps at the same time right here? Mm -hmm. This is a, a CME impact. Mm -hmm. What happened to force that geomagnetic storm last night is right here. It's the interplanetary field shifting. Mm. So the phi mm -hmm. angle did this massive shift. And you could see what happens then as the plasma speed goes up, the temperature's going up. Not much effect on the density. So the density shifted first, then the magnetic field shifted, then we had a geomagnet geomagnetic storm. You know, I was looking at Solar Ham this morning, and um, they have some text on their website um, saying that these flares, some of the impacts were starting to be felt three hours after they happened. That seems rather <clears throat> quick. Yeah, well, that always happens. So if mm -hmm. it's large enough, if the flare like these, this, there was a, the X flare was the combined effect from two simultaneous yeah. flares. Yeah. So neither of them might have been an X flare on its own. Right, right. But they were both happening at the same time. The major CME came from AR3614 in the northern region, and the majority of the plasma is shooting to the north. Yeah. But some of the plasma is coming at us at a very high speed, but it won't reach us for 48 hours. Right. But what happens at relativistic speeds, say that five times fast, mm -hmm. and that simply means approaching the speed of light. Mm -hmm. What happened was 
um, we got bombarded with protons. Yeah. We can, we can see it here on Lasco. Do you see all these dots? Yeah. Those are not stars. That is yeah. radiation. Re wait for it. One, two, three, it arrives and there's the radiation. Yeah. Yep. Major CME takes a few seconds. And then there we have the graininess. Yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes it's so grainy, it's maybe five or 10 times more grainy than this. So mm -hmm. this is not like one of the strongest CMEs ever. Yeah. Yeah. But nonetheless, well, go ahead. Either way, I think the uh, the geomagnetic storm and maybe the, the proton bombardment severely affected my sleep last night. <laughs> I've noticed that happen before, and I spent a lot of the night awake. So it's quite significant. Here we are at the GOES-18 proton flux. We entered, oh, it's still going up. So we entered S1 proton storm about six hours ago, eight hours ago. And mm -hmm. right now we went into S2, and we may hit S3. Mm, yippee. <laughs> so, so stay indoors, kids. Because I yeah. just refreshed it and it went straight up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're we're still in it. <clears throat> no, so that all that means, and we can even let's run some of these through. We can watch the event. Maybe no, this is probably why I froze up. I have too much stuff going on here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had too many videos parsed up, so it froze. But you could mm -hmm. see that northern active region did something weird there. And these mm -hmm. two, right when they face Earth, are going to flare at the same time right now. Okay, I was a little early. Boom! <laughs> so that, so also, we've got this coronal hole here. Yeah. Coming out of that hole is another stream of energy, which is connecting with Earth in the next 24 hours. So lots of space weather piling up. And it's not over. This sunspot is 30% of X flare here is beta gamma delta. So, and what we can see from today in the last 24 hours from GOES X ray is a one, two, three, four M flares and that long duration X flare. Yeah. Yeah. So, very active day on the sun. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too, you know, because you and I have been talking a lot lately about the phenomena of earth facing quiet, you know, wondering what exactly causes that. Um, and we've just now had a significant flare that was earth facing in the face of being, I'm going to argue in the process of a magnetic reversal. Yeah. So, so I think that these spots, because of their position, they're both uh, longitudinal. They're in line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they may be canceling out that Earth-facing quiet effect. One's in the Northern Hemisphere. The other one appears to be in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe if you have two lined up sunspots moving across the disk, they cancel out the Earth-facing quiet for some reason. Maybe. Well, and interesting, too, that we have these two other spots that have come around the limb right behind them that are smaller, but in certain ways look somewhat similar. Yeah, Right behind here and in a line. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting how they went off at the same time. Yeah. I don't ever recall really anything like that. Yeah. I don't either. In the last decade happening. Yeah. Yeah. And this all ties into the cataclysmic polarity shift uh, PDF, which we're going to share with you here. Mm -hmm. And you were going over some of the ba uh, general statistics on space weather. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I mean, and these are these are some of the stats that Tyler Williams, who wrote this paper, is putting out there. Um, so I, I think I was saying that over like a he's estimating that over like a two, let's say a two hundred year reversal. So he's 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 hypothetically using a reversal that takes about two hundred years to complete, um, and in that time frame, you'd have about ten thousand CMEs um, and a couple of several superstorm events. Um, another way of looking at it would be in that same time frame, you'd have about 40,000 M and X flares. Um, so obviously not all of those are going to be earth facing, but in the face of a weakened magnetic field, we're going to be more affected by those flares. So, I mean, that, that all together tells you that the likelihood of us 
um, being severely affected by such a flare and or a CME is actually very, very high. Like it seems almost impossible that we wouldn't be affected by one. Would you agree? I uh, 100%. The likelihood of being affected by one is pretty much 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So and the if, weaker and the weaker the field gets, lesser events uh, the become more severe. Right. So well, smaller I, space weather events affect Earth greater the weaker the magnetic field is. Right. And and I would argue, and I think we talked about this in the show last week a little bit, that we've already started to see that. We've already started to see. KP be more unstable than we expect during certain CME events, for example. Um, that you know. That, also, that's, there was an incident with Starlink, where Elon Musk lost an entire launch of satellites because right. they were not prepared for the amount of energy up in the ionosphere when they launched them, and this was due to a right. space weather event. Right. Right. Which barely was at KP five. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a perfect example of what Tyler Williams is talking about in this paper about how wildly and completely unprepared we are for space weather events that are going to affect us more due to a weakened magnetic field. Um, I would even argue that he doesn't even go far enough in exploring these impacts. Um, maybe he was trying not to be less scary. I don't know. But like, for example, uh, go ahead. Also, in the last decade, um, the Aurora Watchers have have uh, seen uh, new types of Aurora that have never been observed, including right. Steve and right. uh, pick, certain types of picket fences and red Aurora. And they don't have any explanation when the explanation is staring right at them. Yeah. I yeah. don't understand that. Right. It it's doesn't like take nobody can put the pieces together. It, it really doesn't take much to figure out what causes more aurora and more unusual kinds. Like it's the information is out there. It's not hard to find. So to me, that's just like willing ignorance and lack of research, because I don't think you'd have to do a whole lot of digging to figure that out, at least at least to get you on the right track for what causes that. Yeah. But um, I mean, the okay. purpose of this paper was what we have up here. National security impacts. Right. Um, and I mean, OK, so he goes through a variety of areas where there's going to be major impacts, right? Um, communications, you're going to have cell phones impacted, radio and, and satellites. Anything that uses um, GPS timing signals is going to be affected, whether CMEs are involved or not. Right. So and that's that's everything. I and mean, we, we depend completely on satellites. Right. Um, everything on land, on sea, on air is all affected by that. Um, you know, he, he makes some, 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 he points out some things that I, I actually kind of find a bit silly in light of some of the other facts. Like, you know, he talks about the fact that we would have to reroute aircraft away from the poles, um, which was going to increase the amount of time that flights take and the fuel that's, that they need to carry. However, he also talks in great detail about effects to the electrical grid. So I, I think that in a scenario like this where, you know, we can't fly certain places anymore because of the effects of space weather, if it's also affecting our electrical grid, I don't think we're going to be flying at all. Yeah, there's a disconnect between what is going to happen. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because in the very beginning here on page 22, he alludes to the most serious effect of what's going on here. It's the weakening of the geomagnetic field. Mm -hmm. And then... If it decreases enough, um, it's severe space weather events. So eventually, the severe space weather events are going to take out the grid, and none of this matters. Right. Um, so maybe the re the reason they're they're all maybe it appears to be given equal weight, uh, and this is what I described as long as a decade ago is that it's not uh, this isn't like a light switch. We've this has been rolling out for decades. And so it's a gradual uh, decrease in the magnetic field with increasing effects. So mm -hmm. what we're going to see is more space weather effects 
affecting communications, affecting satellites. Some satellites mm-hmm. will come out of the sky and, mm-hmm. and, and there'll be brownouts. And then because of that, when the entire grid goes down because of the big event, the whole world will know what's going on. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's this, I'm kind of jumping ahead of where I wanted to be, but there's this funny sentence that he has in here that kind of illustrates it all to me, right? He says, uh, airline industry would have to deal simultaneously with hazardous space weather in flight and seek to continue operations to locations without electrical power. So we're dealing with loss of power, um, also loss of communications, right? Which is like wildly important for for air travel, right? You need to be communicating with a tower at all times. You cannot have lots of little moments where you can't have that communication. That's not going to work, right? And can you and imagine? Can, we still have planes imagine, in the sky. Listen <laughs> to this scenario, and I think this may happen. Can you imagine? It's just any given day. There are a half a million planes in the air, and a right. geomagnetic storm arrives and takes out all of air traffic for 12 hours. Right. Do you know how many planes will crash? Yeah, right. But are right. all these guys just going to try to land somewhere? Right. I mean, I you're not going to be planes tra- landing at the same time. Right. You're not going to be trying to deal with adverse space weather. Uh, it, it's just crazy. I mean, I, it, it sort of helps. It does in some way help to look at each of these areas separately, and then you can kind of put it all together and imagine the domino effect. Um, but he doesn't really go there, um, which is funny. I mean, just as an example for um, the electric grid, right? Um, so he says there's about 2,000 extremely high voltage transformers in the U.S., And he's estimating that in the face of a massive CME, while our magnetic field is severely weakened, um, about 350 of those would go out. Each one of those costs between two and $7.5 million a piece, and they take about a year to manufacture. So I'm sorry, but I don't think we're going to recover from that in any not even medium to long term time frame. I mean, once that happens, everything else falls apart, right? You can't pump fuel, you can't pump water, you can't have sanitation services, you can't have recovery services. They don't have fuel to run around and help people who have no power, no access to groceries, no access to water, no access to sanitation, right? Like that's huge. They'll get some generators up and running, but you can't live, you can't run the entire infrastructure on generators. Well, and even if you get the generators going, where are you getting the fuel to support From them? Other parts of the country that may still be functioning. Right. So you'd have to go to another part of the country where you still have electricity and therefore you still have pumps working in order to get the fuel to run the generators. But like this is at this point, this is where it becomes wildly chaotic, right? Because now you have to travel long distances to move that stuff too. Yeah, and and this is not a fairy tale. A modern example is the 1989 collapse of the Quebec hydroelectric Mm -hmm. plant. Mm -hmm. This was during solar max, okay? Yeah. So the magnetic field was stronger because we have lots of CMEs coming at us and this still happened due to a geomagnetic storm. Right. Uh, the Quebec hydroelectric plant failed 90 seconds after yep. the solar storm injection event, and it left millions of Canadians without power for nine hours. I think it was so 12 hours, but yeah. The events we're talking about are going to be even worse. Right. I mean, that's a small, that's a very, very small event in light of what the consequences would be uh, with a major CME with low magnetic field. I mean, it's... Uh, the consequences are just so much larger than anything we've experienced. I mean, we talk about this well, a lot. Let's put it into context. The the Quebec uh, hydroelectric plant failure, that CME was about one quarter the strength of the Carrington event. So like right. X5 or right. X6. So right. an X20 earth facing now, 30 years later, yeah. oh my. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. And, and and as we've discussed many times, right, you know, the Carrington event is a great example 
uh, except in a time frame where we didn't we didn't have all of the electric infrastructure that we now have now, right? We had basically we had telegraph lines at the time, but those lines still caught on fire. The equipment caught on fire. Um, you know, the the telegraph system basically went down completely, right? Imagine that happens today with everything that we're running over electric lines. Um, over internet cables, all of the components and infrastructure that we have on upon which our entire civilization is based and functions. Um, satellites. And, the, and a lot, uh, what this guy didn't have back then when he wrote this is the information mm -hmm. on Miyake events. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Those are like Carrington events times a hundred or a thousand. Sure. Sure. Um, and then, you know, and then, you know, he talks about satellite infrastructure too. Uh, so 10, nine years ago in 2015, there were 250 satellites. I don't know how many there are now. Um, and that industry is like a, it's like a $75 billion investment, right? Uh, and you make like 25 to $80 billion a year from those satellites. And one of the stats that I find really interesting that he pulls out is that Operators of satellites spend right now spend about forty percent of their time dealing with anomalies with satellites. Right. So these are satellite constellations. Let's be clear. Elon yeah. Musk is just one number in there. His right. Starlink is a constellation of forty or fifty thousand satellites. Right. So we're talking millions of pieces of junk up in space right now. Right. And now, now, now we have. With, with this hypothetical scenario, which is not exactly hypothetical in the sense that it's pretty much guaranteed to happen at some point in the future, you've, it, it, with, a, with a major flare event, you've got those satellites being bombarded with radiation, right? Which is going to cause them to deorbit and heat up as well. Um, well and of course, once you deorbit, then, then you start burning up, right? Um, yeah, and luckily, most objects are too small to reach the surface. You need to right. be over six tons, I think. I think that's the threshold and a certain what, to, density. Not, to, to make it through, burning through the atmosphere? Yes. Yeah, okay. It's got to be a relatively large object to hit the ground. Right. Like Skylab so, was 80, 800 tons, and like almost all of it hit the ground all over in the 70s. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, the, the threat isn't so much from falling satellites as it is from the fact that we're so depend, our infrastructure is wildly dependent on satellites, right? So again, communications and all of that, like all of that stuff goes down. Well, How I don't know. So I, function? If we have a million satellites burn up in the ionosphere, that is going to be geoengineering. The amount of particulates yeah. that will be left up right. there will block the sun. It could right, literally send point. us into an ice age. Right, right. Yeah, I Very don't think point. anyone's ever calculated that. Right, right. So that's, you, you know, that. all the GPS timing stuff, that all goes away. All the communications go away. You know, internet depends on that. Television depends on on satellite. Like, all of that goes away. Like, all abilities to communicate. I mean, the, the, uh. the GPS, the issue with GPS timing signals is particularly interesting because it's like, it's not just that it's affecting the GPS itself. Obviously, as well, and he doesn't talk about this in this paper, but in the in the course of a magnetic reversal, um, given that GPS is relying on the electro, is it relying on the electromagnetics it, in terms of the, the actual positioning? Actually, maybe I'm not really sure about that. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. No, here. it's an array of three different satellites that triangulate from space. Okay, right. So that that kind of gets you around the issues with let's say directional navigation, whereas like a traditional compass obviously is going to be very affected by a weakened magnetic ma mag magnetic field, right? Yeah, but large space weather events will fry the GPS satellites and right. they might not be, have any GPS. Right, so that's like the just having the, the positioning system in place, that's hugely important for everything, for oil rigs, you know, any kind of land, sea, uh, and you can see here, this is what happens. So as the energy comes in to the poles, there is complete radio blackout here in red in the in mm -hmm. the in the Antarctic and the Arctic, mm -hmm. and a sub radio blackout on the day side here. Mm -hmm. It's the side facing the sun, mm -hmm. still getting zapped long just from all these M flares right here. Yeah. So well, and last night, like a yeah. uh, huge portion of Asia was in blackout as well. Yeah, all of Australia because they were on the day side. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep.
So it's happening right now. And the public should be learning about this so they know how to follow it so that you could be ahead of the curve when some of these things may roll out. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get to that at the end. But it's like if you live in a major city, you really have to know when these things may occur. Yeah. Well, so you could get out before you're stuck in an endless traffic jam or a nightmare. Well, right. I mean, if you're in a city and you <laughs> you are inherently reliant on, a, a, let's say, electricity just for your water supply, right? Because you need electricity to run pumps to get water to your house. You're not getting water to your house once the electric grid goes out. It's not happening. Um, you know, at least if you're in the boonies somewhere, you have other options. If you have solar, you can use that to power your well, for example, stuff like that. Um, you could hand dig a well. I mean, you have other options. Here. Well, and the water pressure in Pagosa comes from elevation. So they, the, the water tanks are a thousand feet above the areas they pump it to. Right. I mean, it, it speaks volumes of like the older systems of, uh, what do you call those, those gravity tanks? I don't remember what the names of them. You, you see them often for like smaller towns where you have a, a tower that has, you know, water in a huge Water tank. tower. Yep. That's how they the generate tower, pressure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. You know. So we still do that in the West. <laughs> you know, in my in my old house in Philly, uh, I had a closet with a, 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 a water tank on the second floor because it was originally a gravity-fed water system, which is interesting. Um, but then, you know, he also goes a little bit into um, the effects on agriculture and the food chain and – this is where he really misses the mark, in my opinion, because there's effects far beyond what he discusses here. So, you well, know, and, and to do his uh, credit, mm -hmm. no good paper on the increased UVA, UVB was out at the time for him to peruse to maybe yeah. understand there's larger effects on the biome and the biosphere. Right, right. So, I mean, he talks about increases in let's say skin cancer, right? Which obviously is going to be the case, but I think the effects of the radiation, high amounts of UVA, UVB, and UVC is, that's that's an enormous amount of radiation for organisms on the planet, right? And that's obviously not just going to affect mammals, but it's also going to affect crop yields. Um, he points specifically to a particular ocean, small ocean microorganism that is a enormously important part of the oceanic food chain. And then he goes, ah, what? Phytoplankton. Yeah, he, he has this, I don't remember what it was. It's a specific genus, uh, okay. radiolari radiolaria. Oh no, those are, they have silica shells, radiolaria. Okay. They create diatomaceous earth. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, that that's one tiny organism out of probably millions of species, right? Um, so he kind of goes, well, that might affect the ocean food chain, but I don't know about, you know, the land food chain. And it's like, come on, man. Like, if, if that happens, obviously there's great propensity for this to affect many other organisms. And, and in he, geologic time, it's interesting. If you look at the mass extinctions, yeah, some of them only affect the land animals and the land biome when mm. most of the ocean creatures did fine. Well, they're probably somewhat shielded just from yeah. the water itself, right? Yeah. Well, kind and also like if it was like an impact event, everyone burns on the surface, but if you're underwater, you're golden. Right, right, right. Yeah. Funny enough, I was just watching a little video the other day of some divers underwater when a 7.5 earthquake off the coast of Japan went off. And oh. it's 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 kind of fascinating because they're get, kind of getting like thrown ar around a little bit and they're like trying to hang on to coral and stuff, but they're actually in one of the safest places they could possibly be. Uh, the tsunami would go right over them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, so then he also talks as far as agriculture about um, uh, these uh, center pivot irrigation systems that a lot of um, commercial um, agricultural operations use something like, I don't know, 40 percent of all major agricultural operations, um, you know, and, and they require electricity. So that's not going to work. And then. Yeah. And that's all out here in the desert where we grow yeah. all the food. Uh, and even the food for the animals, the hay, the oats, right. it's all operated on central pivot and well water because it, we're in the desert. It doesn't rain. Right, exactly. So he points that out too, right? A, 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 a large percentage of these operations um, are in places where you really can't utilize rainwater to grow your crops. And so those systems are really, uh, really 
important. I mean, I've said this many times, but that we are so dependent on large scale monoculture agricultural systems in and of itself is crazy because it means that for any uh, event, you know, wildly catas catastrophic or not, you can't just easily pick up and just move the whole operation. If we were growing our food regionally and locally, we would be able to adapt much more easily because we don't have to make such big moves. You know? Well, luckily, a lot of agricultural zones still work on ditches and flood irrigation like California. Right. Right. So if we could just shift all agriculture back to that type of system where we put in ditches and aqueducts like we have out here yeah. and then get yeah. those going again. Yeah. Because no, those I think require that's... nothing, but, you know, they're all mechanical. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It's it's uh, it's nice. It's kind of um, uh, comforting that we live in a place that does rely on ditches quite a lot. Um, cause it does work, you know, and it's a, it's a system that's been in place for many, many decades. Um, it says it's hard. I, this is insane. It's hard to ascertain the exact impact an electrical power outage would have on the nation's agriculture. No, it's it not. Would, it would come to a halt. It total come to a complete halt. You wouldn't be able to transport any food anywhere. It's going to affect the, you know, the radiation itself will affect the crop yields and stunt crop growth. There's so many problems here. I mean, to me, this is this is the the center point where everything fails, right? Because once you have people starving, that's when all hell breaks loose, right? That's when people start losing their minds and they riot and they steal and things get really crazy. And there's no like in the face of widespread starvation, there is and in the face of a lack of an electrical grid and a lack of communications, you can't you can't put an end to that insanity. There's no way to have a national recovery response to that because the infrastructure to do so would no longer be operational. Right. And think about the panic that would set in when everyone realizes that all their money has disappeared because they don't use cash anymore. It's all on a debit card. It's all electronic. Mm -hmm. They're going to break into the banks. The banks will be looted. The how, the economic collapse will be so swift yeah. within, I think, three days, all all stores and buildings will be looted once everyone catches on. Absolutely. You know, and, and he also has some, I think, overly optimistic um, pictures of uh, of how much food people have. Right. So he's saying that most people have food for like a week. That's probably true. He says 12 percent of the nation lives with out extended food stores but i think what he means by that is like beyond one day I yeah mean, i mean in a week most people are gonna have to be eating ketchup soup right i mean having a one week food supply isn't going to do anything to alleviate any of this nothing absolutely okay. not right um, especially if it takes eight months to rebuild a single uh you know piece of the infrastructure to get the grid back and going right Right. I mean, there's, there's just, there's just no way. So I every mean, human would need at least a year of food in a major power outage. Yeah. If it took out the grid and it's going to take a year to get it back and up and running and you don't have a year's worth of food. Yeah. Your neighbor's going to come looking for you. People are going to be starving. Yeah. Yeah. And what that one year of food does for you too is it kind of allows you, it, get, it buys you time, right? It buys you time to figure out how you're going to get what you need beyond that one year. And that's kind of how I look at prepping these days. It's not a matter of collecting all of the things that you could possibly need because you're not going to be able to do that. And you can't collect all the supplies that you need for the rest of your life. It's just not going to happen. Right. Nor can so you the, anticipate all of that. While you're eating your year's worth of supplies, you need to be stockpiling another year's worth of supplies, which right. means you need to be making jerky, killing game, drying, smoking fish, mm -hmm. on and on. So the entire year, you need to be putting up the next year's worth of food. Right. And and if you haven't done so already, this is the point at which you absolutely have to start growing food at this point, right? <laughs> and and in, in only one year, your chances of success are actually pretty low, right? Because you're going to have lots of failures and make lots of mistakes. Um but you know, well, you're going to have hungry people that may be stealing your food in the middle of the night. Well, that too. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's so many, 
Oh, and, and by the way, back to the, the effect on, on organisms, um, like, okay, he has some estimates about radiation, let's say coming into the atmosphere, et cetera. Right. So he says in Le Champ and Mono Lake, the Le Champ and Mono Lake, um, events, UV went up, increased by about 40% at 40 to 50 degree latitude. And the ozone loss in the upper atmosphere was also about 40%. So that's that's a really significant amount of radiation that we would now be exposed to on a regular basis. So right. that the alone Champ is the, one of the lowest field strengths in the last million years, and it uh, is responsible for potentially the extinction of Neanderthal and many other megafauna at that time. Yeah, forty one point yeah. five thousand years ago would have been hell on earth. I mean, yeah. the irradiation. I can't even imagine it. Well, and as we've discussed, there's very good evidence that the this kind of um, radiation coming into Earth is part of the trigger for major evolutionary changes, meaning mutations, right? Indeed, and we also know, based on some peer-reviewed literature, that certain explosive volcanoes start to heat up from this radiation. Yeah, yeah. And so that means more frequent, violent volcanic eruptions, large eruptions, VEI-7 and greater. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, at the end of the day, when I read through all of this and I kind of see how at times when he, he fails to put together all of the pieces and really acknowledge how just how much of a domino effect this would be, um, you know, he then sort of talks about recommendations and how we can be a little bit more prepared. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, I didn't really read that section because I, in my opinion... I don't think there's really a realistic way to prepare for this. Yeah, you. there is. You just prepare to go back to 1800. Right. I mean, there's a way to prepare for it, like, on an individual level, right? Like, you expect— and So, in 1800, the, the average human was agrarian. 90% of right. all food came from the backyard, and that's right. what you, that's how you need to be. Right. The preparation is being fully self-reliant for your food, for your energy— for everything. And, yeah. and that's, that's, that's really what you can do. But, but for the United States to be prepared to somehow protect the infrastructure that we currently have in place, I don't think that's happening. I think that infrastructure is going to completely fall apart. Yeah. Sorry to be the bear. Sorry to be a, a, a wet noodle, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I would like, I didn't read that section either. <laughs> Just, it just seems so pointless to me. Um, and, well, also, I mean, it's like, as he rightly points out, there's been almost no research on this stuff. There's no interest in actually being prepared for this. The oh. U.S. is, uh, there's a great quote from um, a guy named uh, Michio Kaku. I actually read one of his books like 20 years ago. I don't remember exactly which book it was. but um, he's, he's gone a little woke, though. Has he? Yeah, oh, they shoot. all do. Damn it. Anyway, he just says, you know, that the U.S. is playing Russian roulette with the sun. You know, our chances of not being affected by this are basically zero. So it's just it, it's the fact that there's been no preparation to date not that we know of. I mean, I would guess that the super powerful, the global elites, the people who are building bunkers, they know. They are preparing for themselves, but they are not invested in preparing the country or the world at all. No, and like we said in the last episode, the U.S. governments have been well aware, and world governments, and they probably have hardened grids in their deep underground military bases, and so they'll, they'll have bug out areas that'll be completely fine. Right, right. But and you can't know where those are. No, no. And as you and I have discussed many times, this is probably the reason for um, the climate change hoax, right? Because it is like the last opportunity to extract all of the wealth from the remaining population before we have a major catastrophe, right? And, and yeah, it's, and it's also- While the planet in, in the process. Right. And it's also the way to- to control people, right? To shove them into smart cities on the basis of the idea that we have to, because of climate change, 
et cetera, et cetera, right? Like this is this is the control. It's the the attempt to control the population that is going to be out of control when shit hits the fan. Right. And it all depends on where you'll be when it happens. For yeah. certain people in certain countries, there will be zero change. In third world countries where they barely have electric and they won't, and they're 100% self-sufficient, everything will be fine. Uh, in the United States, in extreme rural areas like where we live, there will be very little rioting and, and stuff like that. But in major cities, it will be a, I mean, it will be Mad Max. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and what, what you point about about third world countries, I think that that same picture kind of applies to what happened around the Carrington event, right? Beca because we were not dependent on an electrical grid et cetera, et cetera. It, it didn't affect us that much. Yes. Did it affect the telegraph, si telegraph system? Absolutely. But beyond that, there weren't a whole lot of effects because we weren't living off of those systems. Yeah. And back then, just like you need to be prepared for, they were 100% self-sufficient through hunting and farming. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. There wasn't I mean, a lot of supermarkets or Walmarts. Right. right. <laughs> Well, and even even places like where we live, you know, we live a, outside of a small town and that helps a lot. And as you rightly point out, there's not going to be as much rioting here, but there will be some, right? Because we have a population of like, you know, 2000 people who live in town and are completely dependent on the infrastructure in town and the grocery stores, right? So as I see it, like if I'm living in town and the only ability that I have to get food is to go to the grocery store and suddenly I can't, I'm going to think about where I can get food and I'm going to say, hey, you know, there's people who live outside of town that grow their own food. I'm going to go there. Right. So can you imagine all 2,000 people fishing in the river? There'll be no fish in like three minutes. <laughs> <I know. laughs> right, right. So even in a, even in a small uh, in, even in a small town, I think that being prepared for other people being not prepared is hugely important. Yeah. So you need security. And when we brought this up to a group of people <laughs> at an event recently, we got attacked. Yeah, that was interesting. You, I, don't, I was... you don't need security to protect your things right. when the grid goes down. Why would you need guns? Right. Like just that I even mentioned firearms seem to trigger that person. This is, we're talking about the Crestone Energy Fair last year. I was thinking about this too while reading this paper. Yeah, actually it was when we said the paramedics are not coming to save you. That really yeah. tripped, tripped Well, that, that's, that triggered her because she and her husband um, have worked in the emergency response field before. Um, and there's, a, there's actually a section in this paper that talks about um, how this would affect emergency response responsibility and the the effect is not good right because because emergency services also require electricity fuel etc communication I, that's number huh? one communication communication yes and communication so uh you know the, let's like as we were talking about earlier if the entire grid doesn't go out well you know, hopefully you can go get fuel from somewhere where there is still electricity to be able to pump that fuel. But it's a domino effect because now you have to travel further to be able to provide these services. And there's going to be so many people who need help. I just I, I don't see how it's even also in this scenario, if you are an emergency worker and you have a family and shit hits the fan, I'm sorry, but your first priority is going to be to your family, not to your job. Yeah. That's what we said. Which, which, as it should be, right? I mean, when you're on an airplane, they tell you if something happens and the oxygen masks fall, you put on your own ox oxygen mask first because you can't be of any use to your child sitting next to you if you can't breathe, right? So that's the logical thing to do. <laughs> yeah, so it's coming at some point, yeah. and we can't know when. No, because there's no way of knowing... How quickly, I mean, we're assuming that a reversal is going to happen based on the state of the magnetic field now and the rate of change that we've seen over, uh, what, 150 years, 200 years since like 1850-ish? Well, uh, I, would, I would say it's going to be an excursion we're in and not a reversal because 99.9% .9 of the time it's an excursion. Sure, sure. But, 
you know, and then, and it's a question is of how severe is the excursion, right? Because the deeper it gets, the weaker the magnetic field becomes. It could become a reversal, but there's no way to predict that ahead of time. And it doesn't matter because it's the same effects. If the field strength right. goes down to 10% and then comes back and it's the same North Pole, right. it's the same as a reversal. Right, exactly. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, the polarity flipping doesn't actually matter. It's the field strength that matters. Yeah, and the Earth doesn't flip, folks. It's just the magnetism. Right. The right. sun is still going to rise <laughs> in the east. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's so, the bad news. And yep. it's not a pretty picture. Well, the good news is that each day is a day you can prepare. Yeah. Right? Yeah. One yeah, thing at have- a time, one day at a time. You can buy a pound of rice. You put that up. You could buy a couple extra cans of this if they're on sale. <clears throat> because prices are only going up in this insane globalist shift. I don't see any time in the near future where uh, everything's going to be super affordable and right. And yeah, so I mean, it, it's start like now. the value of your dollar right now is more than it's going way more than it's going to be at any time in the future. So you might as well put that dollar into what I like to call hard assets, you know, and, and I'm including food in that, let's say, um, because those are things that have real value to your life. Um, the, the, the other, otherwise the money is just, it's just paper. It's just monopoly money and it doesn't, it's not meaningful in any way, nor will it be meaningful in the future. And it will be worth so much less. Yeah. So keeping money in a bank in large quantities is kind of stupid right now. You're better off pulling it out and buying hard assets in the form of anything you can keep in small locations. Precious metals is great. Mm-hmm. Tradable materials, seeds and food, long-term ammo. storage. Yeah. Ammo. Practical thing. You can even, alcohol is going to be very popular. There's always selling. something, you, even if you don't drink, you can trade with it, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the point. You know, we haven't talked about this in a long time, but um, Anita Bailey, who we've interviewed several times in past many, like, you know, at least five years ago, wrote a wonderful book called uh, Cold Times um, that is actually talking about prepping for a grand solar minimum. But I think it's quite applicable to this kind of situation as well. And I think she does an amazing job of sort of going through all of the things that really you should be stockpiling or otherwise preparing for in some way. Yeah, so there's a lot of resources out there. Uh, and then there's us. We're a good resource. We've been doing podcasts <laughs> on this for years. And, and we implore you that the most important thing you can be doing is learning how to grow food. The reason we're out here is for safety and security at our location. But we also wanted to prove that you can have permaculture orchards in any grow zone. You can create rigid greenhouses and be resilient where it gets minus 40 below. In basalt, yep. Colorado, they're growing citrus trees. Yeah. <clears throat> so there are ways to do this. Now, not a lot of people have the funds. Yeah. Or the That's moxie. That's the hard part. Or the yeah. moxie. A lot of people are scared. They're like, I can't do that. Well, it's also extremely overwhelming. You know, there's there's so many different aspects of this to think about. I mean, I find it overwhelming at times, and we're pretty far ahead of the game here. There's still ways in which we're not prepared um, I think we can get prepared relatively quickly if we just apply ourselves. Um, um, but it's it's not it's not an easy thing to approach, but you said it perfectly earlier. It's like one thing at a time, one day at a time, and baby steps will get you there. Well, and we've got we've got people. We've got people in our valley. We got Dell. We've got our neighbor, Randy, and his family. We mm-hmm. know people. We've got, Betty. And, and so there are dozens of people here that if anything happens, we're going to come together as a team. We have yeah. so many independent resources, each of us, that collectively we're going to be just fine. Yeah. And one thing I always see here is like, I mean, out of anybody in our valley, we're the people who are farming the most. I can say that definitively. And what that means is, you know, I think we're going to become like the the small community farm for our valley, right? We're going to have other people chipping in because they are also going to need to reap the benefits of that labor. And we have enough seeds here currently to give everyone within 100 square miles seeds. Yes. Yeah. 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 So it's not like we're going to run out of seeds. No, no. And we're always going to be making more. So... 
because we're a seed farm. That's what we yeah. do. We give out millions of seeds annually. You know, another benefit of living in a rural place like this is that people tend to be more self-reliant in the first place because they have less infrastructure to fall back on. And one of those things is farm equipment, right? Tractors and skid steers and all of that kind of stuff. Like we've talked many times, we live on a dirt road, right? It gets a lot of maintenance from the county in order to have it be drivable, you know? And then sometimes we have issues like, uh, we have uh, mudslides, you know, in, in periods of heavy rain that fall into the road. We have to be able to remove that stuff off the road to, like, get around in this valley. But we have enough people here with equipment that we can get that stuff done. Yeah, guys. And it's not a question of if. It's a question of when. And will you be prepared when it happens? <laughs> That's the big question, isn't it? So, great show. Yeah. Find us tonight on Magnetic Reversal News at 8 p.m. Be safe out there. Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message.